You're okay. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to talk to us a quick um, bit about Family HQ. I know the app's launching later in the year. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, my sister and I, Liz Pro, who's an emergency nurse, are developing an app called Family HQ. Um, and we're hoping this will be an app that will be, you know, used by all Australian families. It's designed to sort of seamlessly and safely manage your kids' episodes of illnesses and their medications with the primary goal of, being, of reducing the number of accidental paracetamol overdoses in kids and also making sure that um, kids with chronic health conditions can better manage those by having reminders for medications and, and it's also going to help you keep track of how much medicine you've got in the cabinet at home so you don't run out in those weekends in the middle of the night when your kids are sick. Yeah, because I had no so idea about be... the stats about overdosing um, paracetamol. I have never even thought about that with my kids and I'm sure I've been close before. So that's basically what the app's going to be there for. Yeah, so we realised when, when we were researching this, and initially it was it was designed because we knew there had to be a better way than those notes on the bench that you'd scribble down in the middle of the night about when you'd given which kid what, or mm. just conversations with your partner. Um, and then when we really started researching into it, we discovered that accidental paracetamol overdose is a leading cause of liver failure in kids in Australia and in Western countries. No way, yeah. So yeah. I think you're onto something with that. We hope so. Yeah. We hope so. Okay, so should we get straight into it and start answering some of the questions? Yeah, so if you want, I'll just tell you a little bit about me. So if you think well, they believe me in my advice, I suppose. So um, yeah. my name's Sarah Gleason for the people that are joining. I'm a rural obstetrician or a rural general, sometimes the term we use. And that just means that we're a bit of jack of all trades, I suppose. So I care for women during their pregnancy. I can do your cesarean. If your baby needs resuscitating at birth, I can manage that. I can manage your toddler's broken arm, your five-year-old severe croup in the middle of the night in the emergency department your teenager with anxiety, your parents if they have a heart attack and grandma if she needs palliation. So we sort of go from cradle to grave, I suppose, is a good way to describe it. And my particular interests, obviously, are in women's health, um, pregnancy care uh, and child health. So We've had so many really people talk about you. Everyone loves you. I just see someone, Jodie Twees, just saying she's the best. So, oh, really that is very kind. I didn't realise there were so many going to indie girls in your group, so they've been yes. very um, <laughs> with their comments. Yeah, it's so great. Okay, so Cara and Melinda have asked about wind and reflux, um, but in particular Justin has asked, I have a six-week-old daughter, she's got reflux, and we've been given a variety of advice. We're on omeprazole and trying to hold her up after feeding, but nothing seems to be working. Any tips on how to manage this? So the first thing I would say, um, and some people might think this is, you know, a bit controversial, but that wind and reflux and colic are really overdiagnosed in small babies. Um, and that's partly the medical uh, and health professions problem is that we've tried to come up with some answers to kind of give an answer to a parent about why their baby might be unsettled or why their baby's not growing like it normally should. Mm. Um, so that's really important to understand and that they're kind of, um, controversial and confusing topics really. So to talk about Cara and Melinda's stuff quickly first is that colic was a term coined a long, long time ago to talk about spasm in the gut and then it sort of got repurposed. Um, a, a male doctor a long time ago sort of made the babies that cry for a certain amount of hours a day for a certain number of days a week for a certain number of weeks in a row that that baby had colic and that's how that word kind of flowed on through the vocabulary and then and then nowadays it's sort of often used to describe a baby that's unsettled or fussy or crying more than average okay and that's hard for parents we know we've all had a baby that you know cried more on a day um, and that's tiring and it's distressing if you don't know what's going on with your baby yeah. and like all parents I've sought help for my kids going well what's wrong with them why are they so upset yeah. So what we do know as well as the reflux is that the actual number of babies who actually have what's called gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is where there's a lot of inflammation in the gut, in the esophagus, is actually very small. And that the term reflux really just talks about some of the gastric contents or some of the contents in your stomach, in your tummy, um, bubbling up your esophagus a little bit. Now that 
happens to all of us all the time, every day, including babies. And for babies, it's important to remember that their baseline level of acid in their tummy is actually very low. And then when they've usually got a belly full of milk, that buffers it out a bit. So any contents that do come back up, whether they've vomited them up or spilled it out their mouth, some babies will spill after a feed, it's actually not acidic at all because the milk balances out the small amount of acid that's in their tummy. So what I see in my practice is that those babies who are unsettled that may have received a label of reflux is often an underlying breast or bottle feeding problem that if that's very closely addressed with a very thorough breast feeding or bottle feeding history and a really thorough examination of the baby plus an observation of a feed, that can often un um, find the underlying problem. Now, there's really good evidence that medicines like omeprazole um, or Losec is another brand, actually don't do any better than placebo, than a dummy medicine, okay? And the advice around popping your babies up on a wedge or nursing them upright after a feed is actually, there's no evidence, there's no science to back that up that it works. Okay. But it just seems like common sense. People think, well, if they've got this acid coming up all the time, yes. we, must, we must try and keep them more upright. But these are also the same babies that might be absolutely so happy settled in their mother's arms sleeping lying flat mm. so i see some of these babies that they just want to be held they don't actually have reflux they just don't want to be put down flat in bassinet on their own they just want to be cuddled all day because they're having one of those days where they just need a little bit more love and they need a little bit more contact time with mum so that's what we see and and that's the main thing to be um be really wary about is that some of these medicines can actually do a little bit of harm as well so there is science that shows that babies who are using medicines like omeprazole or even like my lanta, that, that can actually increase the chance of their baby having a food allergy later in life. Okay. So it's really important to make sure. And there is a small number of babies. There is a small number of babies who absolutely definitely have gastroesophageal reflux disease, so um, more acid than normal in their tummy causing inflammation in their gullet, in the food pipe. And those babies really do benefit from being on those medicines, okay? Some people will say, oh, my baby definitely got better. It's probably just good luck rather than actually any effect from the medicine most of the time. So what I would say to those parents is if those medicines aren't working and you're doing all these things and it's not working, then I don't think that's the right solution for you and your baby. Yeah. And I would take them to your GP, your child health nurse, your paediatrician, so they can have a really good look at you and look at your feeding technique, whether it's breast or bottle feeding, and try and figure out what's really going on. Because the problem is, is that it seems, from the medical point of view, it seems like quite an easy diagnosis with quite an easy solution, but it's simply not as straightforward as that. Okay. All right. So the Mylanta and Gaviscon and, and things like that are probably... Yeah, so the reason they can't find them is because there's not really any good evidence for them and they probably do more harm than good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know, because those cries are terrible. Okay, so on to catnapping then. I guess you just briefly touched on that. Um, we've got Beth, Alita, Danielle and Clara have all asked about this. They've got six to eight week year olds um, mm. that they just can't get past that first sleep cycle. They're doing about 30 minutes and then they're waking up. Um, do you have any advice to get them past? So the first thing I would say is that this is super common because it's really normal. Um, it's a really normal baby behaviour to, to get the sleep that they need. And there's one book that I think every uh, mother, GP, midwife, uh, child health nurse should read, and it's this. Yeah. We'll put it up on our links on our website. It's called The Discontented Little Baby Book. Does that okay. come up back to front? Really? It does, it does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. That's all right. Um, I think it, yeah. I cannot recommend this book highly enough to address the things that we're talking about today. Um, it's a book that I read before I had my second baby mm -hmm. and I wish desperately that I'd read it before I had my first baby. Yeah, right. It entirely okay. changed the way I fed my babies, it entirely changed the way I worried about their sleep. Uh, and it affected me so profoundly that I actually cried when I read this because I thought, oh, my God, why didn't I get to read this book before I had my first baby? Yeah, okay. So... When we talk about sleep cycles in babies, it's, that's, that's one sleep cycle. Um, and there is this obsession around trying to push them out to the second or the third sleep cycle and, 
And I've been there. I've, I've been there patting my baby on the bottom, trying to get it back to sleep just so I can get one more sleep cycle, so I can get one more thing done because yeah. someone told me that that's going to make my baby sleep more tonight. And that's my goal. I need more sleep. But what we know is that babies will get the sleep they need. There's really good science around this, and that's what that book talks about, is that um, babies are different, just like you and I are different, Nadine. We probably have got a different sleep requirement, and it might go from nine hours nine hours sleep in 24 hours to up to 18 hours, and that's a very big difference. And if your friend down the road's baby sleeps for two hours at a time and she gets to have a cup of tea and have a nap and call her friends and your baby only ever sleeps for 30 or 40 minutes you feel like that you've got a problem with your baby. Yeah. What I would normally say to these mums is that don't worry. They're going to be okay. It's not going to damage your baby. There's nothing wrong with them sleeping for 30 or 40 minutes. We understand that means you can't get much done on a normal day. But I'd really strongly recommend these mums consider baby wearing. So having a sling, there's a thousand of them on the market. So having a comfortable one, that's, um, that's safe so the baby's head's nice and high, you can kiss them. That's the talk, They talk about that being a safe distance if you can kiss them, they're in a good position. Yeah. And embracing some baby wearing, putting the baby in a pram and going outside to the walk and not being so focused on the sleep because we've all been there getting frustrated and cross that our baby won't go back to sleep. They've woken up just as we've sat down. My babies used to know when the ping and the kettle would go off, I swear, every single time. The kettle would boil and then wah, yeah. every I think single My baby day. knew when I hit my head on the pillow to wake up. <laughs> um, but no, totally. I had the same with my kid on my second kid. Um, I used those carriers. Um, we've got the piece of them on the shop and it just changed, yep. changed everything. The first one I was trying to get sleep and wouldn't, yeah, bassinet didn't yep. work, but the so carriers are great. I had a very similar experience and I baby wore so much with my second and my third baby and it was yeah. It was such a nice experience. I, I was able to enjoy that newborn period more. Yeah. I think my baby's needs were much um, yeah. closer because they were nice and close to me and I knew that even if they were still a bit cranky, they were fed, they were dry and they were being held. So all their basic needs were being met there. And if they were still cranky, maybe they were just having a bad day because we all have bad days. And babies do as well. And I think the, the tricky bit is that we expect them to be a little bit predictable. A lot of us would have had jobs or been quite organised in our lives and then this little person comes in and throws a big spanner in the works and babies don't work to a timetable. They don't know what you've got planned for the day um, and that makes it hard when we have these days that from day to day can be very, very different, quite unpredictable. And a lot of us, especially with type A, have a lot of trouble adjusting to that. I know I did. So did I. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, we've um, had lots of Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so that's why um, baby going and being flexible say, right, okay, you're up, let's go for a walk. I'm not going to spend another 20 minutes trying to pat you back to sleep to get another 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so just don't so fight it. Just, yeah, don't fight it. Just roll with it. Roll Let with the baby it. fit in around your day. Yep. Go for a walk. Put it in a sling. Um, put it in the bouncer on the kitchen bench while you're making dinner. Like... Bonnie's just like, what about about twins? Twins, I think there are slings for twins, aren't there? There's double... I don't know any specific brands, but I'm sure there are. And as they get bigger, you theoretically could have two. You could have one on the back and one on the front. I know on a really bad day Mm. um, when my youngest was maybe four months old, I had the four-month-old on the front and the 20-month-old on the back. Um, it's yeah, but it worked like it's better than having two crying babies on your lap that are getting upset. So I think the message for that is just going to do whatever works. Yeah, um, that's great. Not to fight them. You can't make your baby sleep. And I think the other really important um, bit is that it's important not to judge your performance as a parent on how your baby sleeps. Yeah, that's nice. And I think that's something that I did in my first, my first baby was small and I actually wrote down a little thick list of things that I was going to do differently next time and that was one of them. And I think that's, if I can say one message to everybody is don't judge them on that, okay, because um, that's not going to change how they sleep at night when they're three or five or ten or whether they're a nice kid or, you know, don't judge your, your parenting skills on how they sleep because they're going to do their own thing until they're ten. Okay.
Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on to eczema now. So Emily and April have asked about eczema and their baby's faces. Um, do you have any advice? So eczema is quite common and sometimes we're running families if they've got asthma or some hay fever and often on their um, babies often get it on their faces sometimes or in their elbows or behind their knees. Sometimes where you might get it on different spots of their body. So the first basic things we talk about is making sure you can keep the skin moisturised. It doesn't have to be with anything fancy, some sorbolines, vitamin E, you can buy some falls is fine. Um, some other brands that are nice are QV as well. They're quite a thick emollient moisturiser. There's lots of things on the market which claim to cure eczema, but most of the time just a nice thick moisturiser will do the job. Um, not getting your baby overheated helps as well. So if you're having um, hot baths or they're getting hot overnight, if your skin gets hot, they can flare up. So that's one easy way. If those simple things of keeping things moisturised and keeping your skin cool aren't working, then the next step is to look at cortisone and cream, so steroid creams. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents get a little bit worried and they hear the word steroid and they get a bit terrified and I try to explain to them this is very different to the steroids that people are using in the gym to bulk up their muscles because that's what everybody seems to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, Topical steroids, so steroid creams, are a very safe way um, to make it smart, and it really is the gold standard of managing it. So when you see um, babies that have got a flares of their eczema, it's usually just because the parents have, haven't used enough uh, eczema cream or used it often enough. They've been a little bit reluctant to use it. So when it's used appropriately, so the right amount to put on in the right places, it's a very, very safe medicine, and it manages eczema beautifully. If you've tried a low-dose steroid cream, so you can get some, it's called 1% hydrocortisone, so you can buy that from the chemist. And if that's not working yeah. and you're applying that twice a day, then the next step is to go back and see your GP, get them to have a look at the baby. Make sure it is eczema, okay? Um, I think eczema is a little bit like fresh sometimes. Everything everything that itches must be fresh and every rash on a baby must be eczema. Um, but it's important to get someone to actually eyeball, eyeball your baby. Um, or just send them a photo in our telehealth phase of life. And what about, like, things in the bath? I know my daughter, when I changed the um, the bubble wash, she started getting yeah. really dry and, and kind of eczema, I would have called it, yeah. and then I stopped it. Yeah. And then it so. Yeah. so soaps, we know that soaps can make it worse. So um, either just plain water, and most babies don't actually need lots of soaps unless they've, like, done a, you know, a punami from their, you know, chin down. Um, or they've been rolling around in the mud, a lot of the time just water will get your baby clean. Um, there are some bath oils that you can use, and I know that you use that QV bath oil with you, so, and, and no soap, you just leave that, and it puts a nice film on the skin, and then you can put a nice thick, thick moisturiser on over the top of it. But certainly avoiding a hot bath or hot shower and avoiding anything um, that's soap-based is going to also help prevent any flares. Yeah, yeah, I've heard QV thrown around a bit. Um, that's good. Okay, so let's get into telehealth. So we have just posted a blog on our, um, on our blog um, about uh, you talking about telehealth. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so it's probably not on the front of everybody's mind, but I thought it's something that um, it's one of those things that you don't know what you don't know, I suppose. And people, some of you listeners and audience might be a little bit worried about, well, how on earth am I actually going to navigate this if I'm unwell or my baby's unwell? Um, so in in the blog that you're going to post, it's got some tips about things you can do before and after the consult. And one of the common concerns from our patients here has been, well, how are you going to know whether my baby's sick or not? Um, how are you going to make those decisions? Because they know all the things that we normally do when someone's sitting in front of us in terms of examining the baby, um, taking temperatures and doing some measurements and this sort of thing. So there's things that you can do at home before your appointment um, that will really help your GP make an accurate assessment of what's going on. So each practice is going to have a different set of software. Um, some GPs are FaceTiming. Sometimes they're using Skype or Zoom. There's a couple of other platforms. And your practice should be able to give you some information about how that works. And they're usually pretty straightforward. The things we'd like you to do at home before the appointment if you're worried about your baby is to strip them down and weigh them if you've got some scales at home. Um, if you don't have a big set of kitchen scales, you can just weigh yourself and the baby and then jump on and just weigh yourself and, and take away the difference. 
because that helps us know if we need to prescribe some medicine how much your baby weighs. If you've got a thermometer at home, taking your baby's temperature before the appointment is helpful as well. And there's also some things that you can do. It's quite easy to actually um, measure how fast your baby's heart is beating. Um, and you can do that by putting your hand sort of under the left nipple and just counting how many beats it goes in 60 seconds. Um, and also doing the same with their breathing. So lifting up their shirt and just having a look at the way their baby, your baby or child is breathing. Are they sucking in in between the ribs? Are they sucking in underneath their ribs? Are they sucking in up here around the wind pipe? Okay. If it's a little baby, is their head bobbing when they're breathing or are their nose nostrils flaring? There's some little tips that we look and some signs that we look out for okay. if a baby or a small child is struggling to breathe. And also to count how many breaths there are in 60 seconds as well. So that just gives us a huge amount of information. Um, the other things we'll, that I ask parents to check is to have a look in baby's mouth and say, right, does it look nice and wet and moist, okay? Yeah. We'll ask you about weeds and poos. So are they a normal amount, a normal colour? Are they a normal smell? Um, and are there any rashes? Are there any lumps and bumps? So I certainly ask my patients if they've got any concerns about rashes and lumps and bumps to email those to me prior or even during the consultation so I can have a look. Yeah. If it's a video consult and the quality is good, then you can probably show me what that looks like. Um, and I've found that some parents are very good at examining their own children, even to the point of feeling their tummy to see if there's any sore spots and feeling joints as well. And so you'd be surprised at how well we can do an assessment. And this really lets us decide about going, is this something we can manage via telehealth? Or do I need to get you to come in for a short examination to have face-to-face? -face? Or is your baby actually pretty sick and do you need to go up to the emergency department today? Yeah. so they can have some treatment. It's yeah. so great. It's just so convenient for mums. I remember as a new mum getting to the doctor's surgery and just thinking about all the germs and everything and even just getting out of the house to have this opportunity of telehealth now that coronavirus has sort of pushed us in that direction. It's a great... It's a and I think there will be, this will be one of the silver linings, Nadine, to come out of this is that it's going to offer some more flexible options for parents and, and for everybody down the track of seeking medical care. Um, which I think is a good thing, and certainly for where we are really. I've some of my patients drive up from 20 kilometres to see me. I can imagine. Yeah. No, Sorry. that's great it's, advice, Sarah. Really, that's really, really great. Um, okay, and the last question uh, before we wrap it up is um, Samantha and Joe have asked about tongue and cheek ties and, you know, how concerned should they be about this, um, speech or yeah, just any development um, things in the future. Yeah. So um, tongue ties um, are also a thing that are pretty overdiagnosed at the moment. So we know that there are a small number of babies and children, probably 2% maybe, who have um, a clinically significant tongue tie. So that means one that affects with their function. And they're the ones that go from underneath the tongue to the floor of the mouth. These are babies that can't get their tongue out beyond their teeth and can't breastfeed um, well or can't eat well. Um, and so they're the babies who might be slow to gain weight or mum finding that breastfeeding is very painful because that baby can't get a really good lash and a really good mouthful of breast to breastfeed well. Yeah. So they're the ones we get worried about, and they are the babies that do benefit from probably just a little snip of that very tight um, bit of tissue that's tethering the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Yeah. Buckle ties, so side ones, posterior lip ties, are what we consider a variant of normal. So if you looked at every single adult's mouth in Australia, you're going to find that heaps of them have that. They never knew about it. But the problem is that this is one of those things that's also been over-medicalised and then there's been an industry built on solving this problem. So what we see is that this is probably a situation where had someone had a very good breastfeeding or bottle feeding assessment um, where a breastfeed had been observed, Yep. that those problems probably could have been sorted out. But again, it's a little bit like the reflux and put them on medicines that it's seen as a solution to a problem, mm -hmm. um, but it can be an expensive one um, and most of the time unnecessary. So those babies, if that, the few of the questions that were on the group would mention that their babies were thriving and growing really nicely. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely fine and you do not need to do anything unless your breastfeeding is painful. So we, I'd recommend those people to go, if you're worried about tongue ties or painful feeding or poor weight gain, is to go and have a chat with a GP or a lactation consultant um, 
Okay. Who is really passionate about this stuff and is, is going to take the time to watch you have a breastfeed um, and to have a look at that position. Because I can tell you nine times out of ten when I ask a woman to, what is breastfeeding in my room? And I observe that. It, nearly every single time, it's just a couple of little tips you can do and usually instantly they're like, oh, that's more comfortable or that's easier or they're not so cranky now. Um, just really tiny things and that's, that's safer um, and much better than going off to have an expensive laser for not me. So cutting these tongue ties that aren't actually going to change your baby's function, its ability to feed, its speech and down the track with dental problems. So okay. um, I'd really encourage those people to get a thorough review um, before okay. they go, or a second opinion before they go and consider having any of those managed. Oh, thank you, Sarah. That's great advice. That really is. Um, okay, well, I think we've touched on quite a few topics. You've um, given us some great advice there. Do you want to um, just do a wrap up? Um, yes. Yeah. So I suppose the main things is that when when do you go and get help? Because we know that parents are the best experts on the babies, and I remember. My mum drilling me when I first started practicing, saying you must trust a worried mother. Um, and I've really taken that to heart and I think it's really good advice. But if you are worried, um, then seek some help. If your baby's not growing, if it's not gaining enough weight, then see someone. If breastfeeding is painful or you're very anxious about breastfeeding and doesn't feel like that, that um, partnership is working well, then get some help. If your baby's not weeing and pooing as much as they normally do, then come and see one of us. If they've got fevers or a rash or you think something's just not right, certainly for babies under three months old, if they are unwell, they're, they're often quite vaguely unwell. So I call them like sneaky sick because they might not get a high fever or they might not get a rash. They might just not quite be themselves and their mother will describe that. They'll say they're just not themselves today. Um, and so that's important for us to go look hard, you know, look hard for the problem there. And I think if people um, are having babies that are very unsettled uh, and having a lot of trouble and mums are getting anxious, parents are getting anxious, is that it's important to go and try and find someone, find a provider who's trained in what's called neuroprotective developmental care. So that's sort of a new concept, it's a big word, but it's essentially about looking after your baby's brain and developmental and emotional needs um, in a responsive way. So my baby's crying, I'm going to pick it up and give it a cuddle. That's its most basic form, which sounds like it's crazy that we need to have a course in that. But what's happened is that over the years, medical and health advice has actually pulled us really away from the instinctive mothering and parenting we need to do. So um, I had a quick check yesterday with one of our friends, Kate, from Sleep Effect, and she's just finished this course, and she said it just blew her mind because the advice they give you is really in contrast to what our parents were taught um, and what even I was taught at medical school. So I think it's important to try and seek out providers who have that approach, and certainly people like Kate or the problems online is an excellent resource, and that's um, that's managed by the woman, by the GP who wrote this book. So I think if there's any takeaway, buy this book. It's 30 bucks. I've got no, I've got no financial interest in it. I buy it as a baby shower gift. I yeah. bought it for my sisters when they were having their babies. My colleagues are so sick of me harping on about it. But honestly, it's a must read. Okay, well, we'll, we'll include it as well. But you've got some resources on your website as yep. well that you can go to. Um, Absolutely, yep. And we'll have them up this afternoon. Yeah, and that's um, you're at Family HQ. I'll put it in the notes. Yes, yes. And so the other thing we're chasing is um, we're going to be ready to test our app in about five weeks' time, hopefully. Um, so if any of your um, audience are keen to test that app for us, we'd be incredibly grateful. We want some really honest feedback um, about how it works and what features you might like to see. And there's also going to be um, a couple of testers who uh, get a chance to have a lifetime sort of free premium subscription. So yeah. um, we're really keen to get as many testers as possible if we can. So I'll be putting my hand up. I'll be helping. Right. <laughs> 100%. Right. My two-year-old, she's always got Panadol and yeah, all that sort of stuff come through. Yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for us. having me. Um, it's been fun. We'll all the notes and everything, we'll wrap it up and hopefully we can do this again. And thank you to everyone who have also um, sent all their questions in as well. And we hope that some of this has helped you out. I know um, I've learned something this this um, chat. So really appreciate your advice, Sarah.
Thanks for having me, Nadine. Okay. Speak soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.